Hello. Today I am interviewing Master Terence Trumbo of Northern Shaolin Kung Fu. Hello. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Can you start introducing yourself a little bit, your Kung Fu history? Uh, yes, I'm Terence Trumbo. I uh, was born in Oakland, California, and um, lived in the Bay Area all my life. I started my martial arts training at 11 uh, with Shotokan Karate. Um, I lived out in the suburbs of Oakland, San Francisco, and there really wasn't much in the way of Kung Fu um, as far as Kung Fu schools. So I started doing karate um, because it was accessible. I got up to about green belt. Um, And I, I was a fan of Bruce Lee and um, Kung Fu movies. Uh, we used to have this program called Kung Fu Theater that was hosted by Tat Ma Wong, who's a, a trolley foot master here in the Bay Area. Um, and I was just really amped to learn Kung Fu. Uh, and when we moved to Walnut Creek, which is another suburb, in the Bay Area, there was a Tai Chi praying mantis master by the way of Wong Lam Ling, who taught there. And so that was my first Kung Fu style when I was a teenager. Um, and he was very hardcore. Uh, as far as teaching, he wanted you to go through the motions of sort of proving yourself, um, you know, doing a lot of physical training. And so I didn't really learn much in the way of forms or techniques from him. But uh, I did have a real appreciation for his Kung Fu though. He actually practiced Iron Palm. He was a really serious master and he was one of Chu Chu Kai's students actually uh, in Hong Kong. And then from him, I studied different other, a lot of other styles in college. I learned Tai Chi. I learned a little bit of Long Fist. Um, I learned from Brandon Lai, a little bit of his Seven Star Mantis. And then it wasn't until I found Wong Jack Man uh, that I really went deep into uh, Northern Shaolin Kung Fu and certain other arts uh, that he taught as well, Shingi and Tai Chi and eventually Bagua. And I only studied with him for two years uh, because he had retired uh, in 2005 and I had moved away, came back, I'd moved to LA and then had come back to the Bay Area. And then I continued my studies with Sifu Rick Wing, who was arguably his top student, Wong Jack Man's top student, and who took over his class, his school, uh, the San Francisco Jingmo Association in San Francisco. So from there, I uh, continued with Northern Shaolin, uh, a little, some Xingyi Chuan, uh, Tai Chi, and Fu Style Bagua. Um, who, and that came from uh, Master Lin Chao Jen, who taught here in San Francisco. And I have been basically uh, the, studying those arts. Those are my main arts, really, is um, the Northern Shaolin, uh, Xingyi, uh, Tai Chi, and uh, Fu Style Bagua. I see. And um, how is for you training these Uh, different arts. Uh, I know that they have many um, core concepts in common as they, they are more uh, northern uh, kung fu, but how do you, can you tell us more about this process of putting it all together and uh, fighting with it? Uh, what were the challenges? What were the things that got easier when you have learned uh, one art? Um, well, uh, 
like with a lot of Chinese martial arts, I, you know, they're all considered Northern, uh, but the emphasis really is uh, very different uh, with all of those styles that I mentioned, like Northern Shaolin, you know, it's very, um, uh, very deep extended stances, uh, emphasis on kicking, really kind of long range fighting, if you will. Uh, Xingyi, definitely more of an emphasis on the hands, maybe more medium range. Bagua um, is, you know, really the point of Bagua, it would seem, is to get behind your opponent. Um, and, you know, Tai Chi, I would say, is really good in terms of fighting in the clinch or, you know, it's very close range, I would say, but also being able to manipulate your opponent um, up close in the clinch, being able to take them down. Um, so there's an, the emphasis on all those styles is really different. Um, and you could say that the Northern Shaolin um, is a good way of fighting at a distance before reaching closer into those uh, ranges. And Xingyi actually, and Bagua and Tai Chi, of course, are considered internal martial arts. Uh, but, you know, I the uh, differentiation between external in, and internal, I think is really a subtle one. I mean, some people make a really big deal out of that. Our teacher, Wang Jack Man, it would almost seem that his internal arts influenced his external and vice versa, because when he performed Northern Shaolin, you almost thought he was doing it um, in a more internal sort of way. Or I mean, it wasn't like a typical, very hard external, you know, he uh, showed a lot of muscular strength, like you might see in an art like karate. Uh, he, and also as he aged, he, he wasn't, um, you know, as, uh, he didn't exert himself as much doing Northern Shaolin, but, uh, the, uh, the point of Xingyi is more to fight in a more linear way, uh, maybe more similar to Northern Shaolin. And then Bagua is to get around the opponent and Tai Chi is you know, I'd say really good in the clinch. Uh, so all of those things can really work together, you know, in a physical conflict, uh, you know, at different ranges. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they complement each other in that way very well uh, because usually fights uh, begin at a distance and then there's the closing the gap and in whatever way you do that. Um, but the Bagua, I would say, um, has been really interesting to me studying that, uh, and the way of getting around the opponent because the other styles, uh, you know, are definitely more focused on, you know, in a more linear, uh, fashion, trying to close the distance or strike at a distance. So, um, so yeah, I would say they can all work very well together in conjunction, um, you know, depending on the range that you find yourself in, you know. Um, can you explain to us, like, uh, what are for you the, the main concept, uh, concept, the core concepts of uh, Baxilam and what one should practice? to have a, a good like shampa, body movement, corporality? Um, well, uh, Northern Shaolin, uh, I mean, basically it's said that it the approach is external to internal really. Um, uh, and it's, you know, quick fluid transitions. The sets really help with uh, basically coordinating your feet, uh, 
and the arms and hands, but with fluid transitions between stances and kicks. Uh, and flexibility is really something to focus on with Northern Shaolin just to begin with, uh, because it's uh, kicks are, of course, highly emphasized in that style, uh, far more than the hands, I would say. So focus on flexibility uh, in order to, you know, have the maximum, uh, uh, to maximize your flexibility for your kicks uh, is really important, I would say. And stances, uh, that's why in our own school, I mean, we basically started with Tom Toy, uh, and I, my teacher, Wong Jack Man, he had me starting with Tom Toy, 12 lines, Tom Toy from Jing Mo, and the 24 lines of a fighting Tom Toy. So that's really one of the main things that I learned from him. And the stances, uh, leg strength was, of course, highly emphasized with that. Um, and and once again, flexibility, uh, because Northern Shaolin is very much um, a kicking art. And it, you know, it's been said that it could be Northern Shaolin, uh, depending on how far back it goes back. I mean, some people believe it really did come from the temple in 1732, whenever the temple was destroyed and the five monks you traveled throughout China and they formulated uh, Northern Shaolin after that, that that style influenced arts like karate, taekwondo, um, and others, and wushu, actually, in the 20th century, it's been argued that it, wushu was very much influenced by Northern Shaolin. Uh, and uh, Gu Yu Zhang, you know, who really made that style famous. Um, so the kicking is very much, uh, you know, a very uh, significant part of the style. And so therefore, you know, flexibility, um, should always be emphasized. Uh, you know, you've got to be limber to do those kicks. I mean, throughout the sets, there's you know, tornado kicks, lotus kicks, flying, I, you know, double kicks. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's a very uh, dynamic style in that way. Um, so that's basically where I place the emphasis. Mm -hmm. And in the classes, did uh, Wong Jackman uh, teach some specific preparation for these kicks, like some specific flexibility training, strength training, or did he prefer working these uh, physical conditions in the sets? Yeah, you know, um, his class, at least when I joined at Fort Mason, in uh, the early 2000s, uh, you could say it was almost very informal in a way. Basically, he had accepted students who had experience from other arts. I had learned a little bit from uh, Guo Lin Ying, uh, well, from Guo Lin Ying's wife, his widow, um, she taught me some Tai Chi and Shaolin. So that was, uh, and I had said that I'd learned Shotokan as well, but that was what I kind of used to get in, in the class. I was like, uh, you know, yeah, I learned Shaolin. And I remember that first day he had approached me saying, oh, you learned from Guo? Because he thought I'd learned from Guo Lin Ying, who was, you know, very, um, who was famous. But uh, I had learned from his wife and, he was like, you know, oh, well, do you want to start over with me? And I said, yeah, well, yeah. And already assuming that I, you know, practiced my own uh, in terms of preparation for a class, flexibility, stretching. Uh, and I had my own stretching regimen. Uh, and pretty much everyone else did in class too. So he didn't 
there was it wasn't an organized structure in that way to where we um, all got together and did the same stretching routine and whatnot. Um, that was much more the case later after he had retired and Sipo Rick Wing had taken over. We, uh, in his class, we did more do that as a class. Um, and uh, stretching, you know, before Sifu uh, Rick Wing's class is definitely highly emphasized. I mean, you know, we do that for about 10 minutes at least before we start. And basically, um, you know, leg stretches, uh, you know, uh, for the most part is what we do for that. Uh, but yeah, Wong didn't really uh, emphasize that in the beginning of his class. It was more kind of you just showed up and then he would assume that you were already maybe limbered up or people would, you know, go through the motions. I would do my own stretching uh, routine. And then he would then walk around the class and say, okay, your turn. Uh, and you would start learning whatever you were learning from him, which at that point was mostly internal stuff. Uh, he was mainly teaching Xing Yi and Tai Chi, myself and uh, a couple other people. We basically got the last of his Shaolin uh, as far as him teaching Shaolin. Um, I was one of the last students to learn any kind of Shaolin sets from him, I would say. Um, be right before he retired. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, it, there wasn't really uh, a very um, tight organization to the class in that way, I would say. It was almost kind of like a master's class. Not that I was a master at the time. I mean, I was just a another practitioner, uh, but you could almost call it that because there were guys in there who were very highly experienced, who had fought full contact in Kenpo, who, you know, had a long history with their own martial arts. Um, and Sifu Rick Wing, actually, uh, he had been with the teacher at that point for about 30 years. So he was really the one who you could say was, you know, uh, the most grounded in Buxulam, Northern Shaolin, and the styles that Sifu Wong taught. Uh, so I see. Um, we we know that uh, Wong Sifu was really how can I say low profile Sifu. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Al almost an em emblematic person in this way. Um, yeah. can, can you tell us about like? How was the relation with the students, uh, his, re his relation with the students, it was quiet, how, how was this kind yes, of thing? Yes, he was very, very low-key, very quiet. And basically, you really couldn't get a lot out of him in terms of uh, applications, really. I, it was my, he... Uh, it, it, it could be kind of like pulling teeth, trying to get him to really go through applications with you. I mean, he would teach you the techniques and, um, you know, he just really uh, was I, not really that forthcoming. I, although the stuff that I learned from him, like the Tom Toy, the two-person Tom Toy, the applications were already in there and uh you know you were doing those applications throughout the set with another person uh, the other stuff um he kind of almost uh you know would maybe assume that you had an idea what he was teaching you in the set uh and there were a lot of other students there with their ideas on what the applications were for all these sets um, but we, uh, you know, it, uh, 
it was uh, something that, as far as application wise, and especially earlier in his school at 880, uh, a lot of the students, you know, there was a lot of sparring, a lot more sparring going on and actual students using what they had learned from him uh, in their sparring. Uh, and he would give advice as far as, uh, you know, at the earlier period of time during when he was teaching his uh, school. At the point I joined, there wasn't, nobody was really sparring in the class. Uh, a lot of people were doing it just for health reasons, uh, to learn the sets, to learn uh, the style itself. Uh, I, a lot of my senior students knew, had an idea what the applications were in all of these tech, these sets that we were learning. So I learned a lot of that from them. Um, but yeah, like I said, he was, he was pretty low key. He, he didn't really uh, even, you know, talk that much about martial arts, uh, at least with myself. With Sifu Wing, he would actually discuss these things pretty in depth. I, I would see him carry on conversations with him about the meanings of the set. Like uh, he would ask specific questions about them. Um, I A lot of my questions at the time were things like, you know, Sifu, uh, do the Shaolin monks uh, do? I do they do our style? I mean, our style is called Northern Shaolin. Are they doing our style? And he'd just be like, No, no, no. Uh, you know, or I would ask him things like that. Uh, that in retrospect, I mean, you know, showed that how unknowledgeable I was in the subject, really. Um, but I could talk to him about small talk sort of stuff. Uh, stuff in media, um, the weather, whatnot. Um, but in a way, he really kind of was, you know, this typical, like what you would think an old school Kung Fu master was like, you know, just always, you know, looking at you, scrutinizing, and you were almost kind of afraid of him in a way, or afraid that he was no longer going to approve of you or, because that had happened. I mean, people had, you know, uh, displeased him in the past and, you know, he would just maybe never teach you again, you know, depending on what you did. Um, and that was always there. I, you were always kind of going, uh, I, you know, I don't want to um, anger him in any way. I don't want to. And that actually almost occurred when I would ask him about the Bruce Lee fight. And I was already told that that was a subject that you weren't really to discuss with him or bring up. Um, but there were times when I, because other people had maybe been talking about it in class, I had brought it up and then this one buddy of mine who was going to school for film had the idea of us doing an interview with him and maybe touching upon that subject. And he got really angry and was like, don't involve me in any TV, newspaper, magazines. Don't. And we got immediately just back down and we're going, okay, yeah, no, no worries, Steve. We're that's okay. <laughs> We're not even going to bring that up ever again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, you know, it was, it was a very interesting class. I, it was, he was very much not somebody who was super talkative and somebody who was just, you know, open to, you know, talking about anything and everything, you know, and most of his students would probably say this as well, that he just wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't a super open uh, Sifu about, you know, uh, just everything, you know, <laughs> even about the style. You were almost kind of expected to figure it out on your own sometimes even. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, this, this thing of the Bruce Lee fighting, I think it's huge because it was like a long time ago and probably like uh, influenced, influenced him uh, until the, uh, the end of his life, you know, because he got really famous and, and in, in this way, um, in the... In the um, we had the movie like the birth of the dragon and he went to the opening right were yeah. you with him can you tell us about his impressions like how it was for him because uh between the two movies there is like <laughs> two really different uh histories i am really cinematographic and so how it was for him what do you think and your point of view about about it yeah, I, that was a really significant time because uh, he had not been teaching for some years after 2005. And he basically, um, that was something that was discussed on online forums. I remember I had been online talking about this on the Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine forum. And, um, and I, it was something that was talked about uh, by, uh, I don't know, Jeet Kune Do practitioners. And there was a little bit of a conflict there as to who won or just how people perceived it, uh, whether or not it really was over the right to teach non-Chinese people, uh, that was really one of the main sticking points is that, you know, going back to 1976, Linda Lee put out her biography saying that this fight was over the right to teach non-Chinese people in the Bay Area. And uh, that was something that apparently I, Bruce Lee never even said. He never, uh, that was something that really came directly from Linda. And so the Jeet Kune Do crowd, of course, uh, they basically hold to Linda's version of that, that uh, indeed it was over the right to teach non-Chinese people. And Wong Jack Nan was this representative of these Chinese elders uh, in Chinatown. And uh, when the movie came out, now that was right after Sifu Rick Wang had published his book, Showdown in Oakland, which I would highly recommend everyone read because it's extremely detailed uh, on the subject. He has a lot of uh, excerpts from uh, just discussions he had had not just with Sifu Wong, but uh, a lot of other people involved in that. Um, Ming Lum, uh, Sifu David Chin, uh, Bill Chen, all these people who were uh, around at that time and had witnessed the fight or had basically interacted with uh, both parties after the fight. So, it seemed as though the movie Birth of the Dragon may have been influenced by that book. I, it was just because there was a lot of buzz all of a sudden around that subject. And then next thing you know, they're making a movie and um, where Wong Jack Man and Bruce Lee are joined forces to fight, to, to fight these bad guys. Um, and it seemed at the time that the book maybe, for sure, in my view, really had something to do with that. Um, and especially the way the book's written, it's not trying to um, throw shade at Bruce Lee at all. I mean, you could almost say that in many ways it uh, makes Bruce Lee seem like, uh, you know, a very human 
not you know in a really bad light at all it makes our sifu seem just like a human and not really you know I, he's of course not really throwing any shade at sifu wong either um and when that movie came out or when we were at the first screenings um i really think it was hoped that maybe this would unravel a lot of the conflict around that around you know i not just who won i because on the the face of it it really is strange that bruce lee quit wing chun right after that fight uh, and you and they acknowledge uh, the Jeet Kune Do um, practitioners and masters uh, acknowledge that that was the fight that caused Bruce Lee to quit Wing Chun and create Jeet Kune Do. Um, but also that, you know, that there wasn't, um, that the conflict was not over the fact that Bruce Lee was teaching non-Chinese people. Uh, that that wasn't it, that it was, you know, that it was just over their differences of opinion um, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, Sifu Wong, uh, the first screening was really significant because uh, it was really kind of a powwow of all of these former students of his. And you really got this sense that he had been at this for a long time, for decades, teaching Kung Fu. And um, it was really great to see uh, all of his students there. Um, and he had hoped, I think, that the movie was gonna do a lot better than it did, that it was going to do very well in China. And then, of course, it turned out that it didn't even get released in China. Um, but at the time there were high hopes that it was gonna, you know, make some waves. And, uh, and yeah, Sifu Wong also, he, he was more candid. All of a sudden he was far more candid about the fight with me than he'd ever been. And it really took me aback. I was going, whoa, I can't believe he's revealing this stuff to me, whoa. And, uh, um, yeah, and then the second screening, there was a second screening after that. Uh, and that was the last time I ever saw him alive, actually, uh, because he had died um, really not too long after that. Uh, and yeah, it, it was really, um, it, I, it was really everyone's hope that maybe, at least it was my hope, that a lot of the conflict over this particular match would maybe kind of dissipate. Uh, but I apparently, I mean, I guess uh, there's people, including it would seem Linda Lee, Shannon Lee, who still hold to their version of events. Uh, and that's too bad in that they still would hold that it was over the right to teach non-Chinese people, which if you know about San Francisco and that book showdown in Oakland really does give you a very, uh, a really good picture as to what the martial arts scene was like back then in the early sixties. Uh, there wasn't that many Kung Fu schools. I mean, there was uh, T.Y. Wong, there was, um, the Hung Sing School, Lao Buns, Hung Sing Trolley Foot. And then there was the uh, Chi and Yu Association where Wong taught Tai Chi. And that was it. I mean, there was nobody teaching Kung Fu or, you know, really advertised in the phone book or anything. People knew about karate. They knew about judo. Uh, but the way that go the story from the Jeet Kune Do side is that there was this group of Chinese elders, which would have had to have been 
I guess, the tongs in San Francisco and the schools that were associated with them. And there weren't any, like the T.Y. Wong's Kung Fu school and Hung Sing, I mean, it's not like they were beholden to some group of elders that were telling them that, you know, this is an outrage that this man, Bruce Lee, is teaching non-Chinese people, not even in San Francisco, his school was in Oakland, and we want this representative to go fight him. Um, and that was really actually completely ridiculous uh, because T.Y. Wong uh, actually had white students before this fight, 1964, he had had white students in the 50s. Um, and, and there was no, uh, and as far as Lao Bun's school, it's not like they were also were against this, uh, against teaching non-Chinese students. I mean, that was a thing around the Boxer Rebellion yeah, but uh, that was when there was a lot of turmoil in China and that was maybe a thing as far as Wing Chun and Choi Lei Foot uh, Sifu is actually at that time at the turn of the century because um, you know they had considered their arts kind of a secret weapon against Western soldiers. And so, yeah, they didn't want to their art to be taught to Westerners. But when we're talking about 20th century, early 60s, San Francisco, uh, that was not a thing at all. I, it was mainly that people just hadn't even heard of Kung Fu. They didn't even know what it was. I mean, in order to find a school, you'd have, you would have had to have gone into Chinatown. You would have had to have found a Sifu who probably couldn't speak English and said, I want to learn your fighting art. You know, I mean, it wasn't, um, that's really the main sticking point, really, I would say, with this um, conflict over events around that fight, you know. Yeah, it's a really complicated uh, history. I, I have read the Sifu Bucky's book, I will yeah. put even in the description of the video because I truly rec uh, recommend people read it. It's awesome. It gathers so much information, information, so much details. Oh, yeah. It's a really good job. And also all Sifu Bucky's books of teaching uh, the North and Shaolin sets, they are awesome. Yeah, and you know, in those books, as far as the techniques, um, I was saying that Wong really didn't give up a lot of the techniques, I, at least to I, students like me or when I was there, but he had taught all of those applications to Sifu Bucky or Rick Wing um, throughout the 30 years that he had learned from him. So he was the one who really did get a lot of in terms of um, the applications in all of these sets, uh, he really got a lot of in-depth knowledge. And I mean, his fellow students as well, his Si Hings or uh, his fellow students also learned from him in that way. But, um, but yeah, he, those books are really great. I would highly recommend them because not only are they very descriptive in terms of the sets, the pictures, uh, you could almost learn the whole set just by looking at the sequence of pictures, but all of the stories and information that are in the uh, books. I mean, he goes into the histories of all these Buxulum masters, uh, people who were related to the school. Um, so, the, I highly recommend those, his Northern Shaolin series. Yeah. And how do you see, and also, what do you think your Sifu, not only Wang Jack Man, seeing this way, like the evolution of Chinese martial arts, because they had like a long career of teaching 
many decades and the world changed a lot in this period. So do you think they changed the, a little bit the methodology? What's, what's your opinion? The, the mythology you say? Or... Yeah, the methodology or the way they see the Chinese martial arts in the world maybe. Oh, how does, um, what, what was the question again? Or how? Um, um, the evolution, like, um, for example, uh, how Wong taught when he began teaching and how he see the, the, the Mola and the Kung Fu scenario when, re, when he retired. And your opinion about it? <laughs> um, well, I... Uh... I, uh, you know, it wasn't just Buck Sulam he studied. He studied uh, Northern Shaolin Lohan too from uh, Ma Kinpong. But he, uh, I mean, I, hmm, I, it's interesting. I think that he uh, was very practical minded when it came to fighting. Um, he had had a lot of experience actually fighting uh, in Hong Kong with his fellow students at Ma Kin Fung's school, it would seem. Uh, he, that's where the bulk of his fighting experience came from, or at least sparring and whatever other fights he got into, we don't really even know. Um, and the, the sets, the Northern Challenge style uh, including all of the two-person sets and everything, uh, were really uh, just kind of a good model uh, for, you know, a classical, some would say antiquated way of fighting in, you know, that came from centuries ago. Um, because when it came to actual fighting, I mean, Sifu Wong and you know, I'm sure his fellow students and his own students, I mean, they, you know, you weren't liable to get into like a deep rooted extended stance where you're, you know, doing willow palms. And I, you know, I mean, it's, those, those were really, I think, um, good exercise and kind of a model for how to think of uh, fighting in that way. Um, because when it actually came to fighting, I mean, he, um, I, he, I think he did find a lot of um, worth in a lot of the more practical ways of fighting, I, you know, like, uh, or styles of fighting, like maybe even, I don't know, I sometimes I think maybe even Muay Thai, because, you know, I've seen him, his guard being described as this when he would spar, you know, he, uh, and he seemed to think Maybe Benny the Jet or Kidez was pretty good at the time. I, at least I'd heard him, uh, heard it said that that that's what he thought. Um. So I, in terms of, um, you know, the effectiveness of kung fu, um, I would think I thought maybe uh, in terms his shingi was something that maybe he emphasized more when it came to practical fighting, uh, like especially later in his life. Uh, and he definitely was training, uh, doing Tai Chi a lot more uh, near the end. Uh, and the way it's perceived in the movies, I think he definitely would acknowledge that a lot of what you see in movies is just pure fantasy. Um, and that, of course, that is not what you see in whatever the Matrix movies or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon or whatever is a very fantastical way of um, fighting. And he didn't, you know, see anything necessarily wrong with that as far as, you know, for entertainment purposes. I mean, in the fight, 
in Birth of the Dragon, you can tell it's really stylized and they really kind of were trying to make it seem like current Shaolin uh, fighting the way it's done by the monks uh, in the Songshan style. Um, you know, they, they were trying to really inject that into the movie and suggest that that was maybe how he fought. Uh, against Bruce Lee's Wing Chun. And I, I think that he was more just kind of amused by all that and just thought it was, of course, um, you know, not accurate as to what the purpose of our training was. Um, but, um, but it was just, you know, for, I think that he, uh, he thought that maybe just for entertainment purposes, uh, you know, it was okay. And he would, uh, he didn't think there was anything wrong with uh, showing Kung Fu in that way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he uh, wasn't so, you know, I don't know really what else to add to that. Um problem <laughs> you know yeah yeah it's i mean the the northern Shaolin sets really i you could say and in my view too is they're really good exercises in terms of you know, flexibility in terms of projecting power the fluidity of your movements uh especially just blocking the footwork that was one thing i noticed about him is his feet uh were always perfectly placed, it seemed. He just, whenever he moved, whatever he was doing, uh, he would just be able to perfectly place his foot, almost as if there was just no question, or there was no unsureness as to where to place his feet, you know. Um, and I think that probably came from his, you know, just doing Northern Shaolin for so long, uh, the Lohan sets. Um, but, you know, when it came to practical fighting, I don't think he had any, um, I, I think he was pretty much clear on what worked, you know, and what wouldn't in like an actual conflict. And what's your opinion about, um, the, the use, the place of, uh, Kung Fu in modern sports competition and... And even uh, using the traditional Kung Fu in Sanda, because uh, sometimes here in Brazil we see the, the scene that some people practice uh, traditional Kung Fu, but when they go fighting, they use mostly Sanda and more, like, more kickboxing. And we don't uh, even recognize the, 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 the style, the traditional style, you know? Yeah. Um... Well, you know, uh, when I first uh, started back in the early 2000s with Sifu Wong, there was another school in Oakland that was uh, basically headed up by his former students, um, uh, Brent Hamby, uh, Dan Carr, um, Dave Turquette. These guys had learned a lot of traditional stuff from him. And then when he... Uh, basically stopped teaching in the East Bay in Oakland. Uh, they continued with uh, teaching in the class that he had formerly been teaching in. And then he basically was just teaching in San Francisco, Sifu Wong was. And they really got heavy into the Sanda and actually competed uh, nationally, internationally as well um, in Sanda. And at the time, I did a little bit of that too. Um, I had learned from Brent Hamby uh, for a short period of time. Um, uh, I had practiced Sanda. And uh, in his view, it was basically um, the traditional stuff complemented his Sanda and a lot of the guys who fought on his team um, and also his fellow classmate, Dan Carr, I, he would say things like, 
he felt that the Xing Yi that he learned from Wong really helped him in his actual fights uh, and helped him to win fights. Um, and Brent also had said that his Tai Chi, the Tai Chi he had learned from Sifu Wong helped him uh, in Sanda. And so that was a unique school, I would say, because in Sifu Wong's class, we learned mainly just all traditional stuff. Of course, we learned all the traditional forms, but in their class, they would do mainly emphasize uh, some Shaolin, um, the Tam Toy, the two-person Tam Toy actually, and um, the Xing Yi and Tai Chi. And then for the second half of the class, they would concentrate on, on Sanda and hitting pads and doing techniques. And so, yeah, they, I mean, there was maybe in terms of like hand skills, uh, more of an emphasis on boxing uh, in a way. Um, but there was always this sense that you were trying to integrate the two that, uh, you know, that they were complementary. And of course, that's the attitude that they more or less have in China, where you have wushu and um, all of the performance-based uh, kung fu with that, and then sanda. Um, and they're supposed to be sort of two sides of the same coin as you always hear it. Um, and in my view, uh, I think indeed that the traditional stuff can definitely uh, complement the contemporary sanda or kickboxing. Um, I have a fellow student who uh, does Muay Thai and kickboxing who swears up and down that he uses his Tai Chi praying mantis when he's fighting, uh, doing kickboxing or Muay Thai. Um, and I, I mean, I, you've seen that in like MMA too. Um, fighters like, I don't know, Anderson Silva, he's of course always big on using traditional stuff. You've seen him try to use Wing Chun. Um, and I mean, I think that they can complement each other. Um, and, and Sanda though, it should be in, uh, emphasized is a sport, you know, it's sport fighting. And of course, traditional martial arts was never meant to be sport fighting. Uh, it's for actual conflicts. Uh, I mean, life or death situations. Um, so, I mean, I don't see a problem in, you know, basically trying to use the concepts of one to uh, help out with the other. If you're into combat sports, if you're an active uh, competitor, um, and at, it should be noted, uh, there is a Northern Shaolin uh, fighter, basically, uh, who did have some success in UFC. Uh, country Roy Nelson, if you've heard of him, uh, he was um, he was a student of Stephen Baugh's, who was a student of Kenneth Way and Cam Ewan. Um, he actually, in some of the fights that I saw him in, in UFC, he seemed to be using a uh, technique out of our Pierce the Heart uh, Shaolin number four set. Um, and he was a big guy. So he would come up over the top and just knock guys out with this same technique that we do in our set like every day. Um, and it would seem it came from that. I'm not, I don't want to say for sure whether it did, but it seems like, it seems like the exact same movement. Um, and that was one throughout the years, I was always kind of pointing out like, yeah, see, I, country, no, you know, Roy Nelson, he must be using our Northern Shaolin, uh, you know, because he was really big on that. He, uh, he had started learning Northern Shaolin from Stephen Ball in, Las Vegas and Stephen Baugh had moved out there from Los Angeles 
he was uh, a student, like I said, of Kenneth Way, who was a student of Johnny So, who was one of Yim Sung Mo's students, um, and Cam Yuen, who was one of R. Sifu Wong Jack Man's students, and uh, Ma Kin Fung. Um, and, you know, so I think that there are some examples uh, from what I've seen of traditional Kung Fu techniques, uh, definitely karate, because karate, there is kind of a more emphasis on, uh, on uh, competition. Um, and because, I mean, it is like uh, karate's an Olympic, uh, it's actually one of the Olympic sports. And it, so you see that in mixed martial arts, you can see a lot of karate people like maybe Lyoto Machida, people like that using actual karate techniques, but Kung Fu as well. I, it's just not, um, uh, in terms of traditional techniques, you don't see it as much, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like I was saying, one can complement the other, uh, but they're definitely for different purposes. I mean, all most, the vast majority of the techniques that we train in traditional martial arts are not for necessarily for combat sports. You know, the emphasis is of course different. Um, but yeah, I... And in this way, uh, what do you consider uh, the problems Kung Fu is facing nowadays, like, uh, in terms of getting more students, in terms of uh, even the, the, the time of teachers' preparation, you know? Like, yeah, well, you know, uh, in terms of marketing, um, definitely MMA, uh, you know, I know I was maybe kind of talking MMA up a little bit there <laughs> because of country Roy Nelson, but... Um, uh, uh, MMA has definitely seemed to have, have eclipsed um, traditional martial arts in terms of the excitement uh, that once was there. I, when I was a kid growing up, everyone wanted to learn Kung Fu. Um, and it was hard to actually find actual traditional uh, or Kung Fu masters who, uh, who had a solid lineage um, because people were so Kung Fu happy that you would have McDojos popping up. You'd have uh, guys who said that they knew a complete style when they probably had just learned it from a videos. Um, and the basically the um, marketing behind Kung Fu was very powerful. Uh, you know, it was very much uh, something that I, people sought after. I, myself as a teenager, I mean, I, uh, in the suburbs, there wasn't much in the way of actual traditional Kung Fu schools. And I was, I had to go to the city. I was seeking out uh, qualified masters, I was really adamant about learning Kung Fu, like actual traditional style. Um, and now I think in the 90s with the onset of MMA, and then especially UFC and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, people started, I think, to question the uh, effectiveness of Kung Fu. Chinese Kung Fu without really realizing that um, they were being too general in their view of Chinese martial arts. That, you know, Kung Fu I, basically, or Wushu encompasses a whole vast array of different styles and different approaches to martial arts. Uh, I mean, when you look at two styles, like say Wing Chun and, you know, I don't know, Hungar or Tai Chi or um, Baji, I like, I mean, 
there's vast differences in the way that uh, in those styles are performed and like what the whole purpose of them is. And uh, I mean, they're so different. And, um, and so for people to think that, you know, oh, it's all Chinese Kung Fu, whatever, it doesn't, um, it's not as good as say a well-rounded fighter with kickboxing and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I mean, that, that it seems like that started to become the model of what you should learn in terms of martial arts and like self-defense basically. And, um, and I think that the challenge is in trying to um, show that these traditional techniques, you know, or traditional styles and ways of fighting can be effective. Um, and, you know, they shouldn't be discounted. And, you know, it can be incorporated into combat sports if that's what you're going for, if that's what you want. But also that MMA is not necessarily, um, you know, the best self-defense uh, style uh, to learn. I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, self-defense in terms of on the street, um, it's been pointed out, and I feel too, I, that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, somebody shouldn't have the mind that that should be their only go-to um, self-defense style to use uh, in terms of defending themselves on the streets. I mean, you go to the ground, if you're up against more than one opponent, you're dead. You know, if you uh, try to shoot in, and you don't care that you're going to get claw, you're going to get hit. Uh, it's just to try and get the opponent to the ground. I mean, you're still in a precarious situation as far as you know an actual conflict on the street. Um, in combat sports, I mean, it's you know it's all good. It could definitely uh, you know get you a win, I guess. But um, but yeah, I basically trying to de-emphasize this notion that mixed martial arts is the best self-defense style um, and that traditional arts don't have anything to offer, um, which I feel they very much do. Um, and um, the, the people that look for Kung Fu today, uh, uh, what do you think they are looking for and how can we uh, sell then uh, how the relevance of Kung Fu in modern uh, era, in your opinion? Um, well, I, like I said, just um, selling the uh, actual uh, legitimacy of the uh, self-defense techniques in the arts, uh, in arts like Northern Shaolin or Xingyi, uh, you know, convincing people that it's a legit way to defend yourself. I mean, I can say for myself, uh, in some of the actual physical conflicts I've been in, um, because I was so uh, enthusiastic about Sifu Wong's style that he was teaching me, uh, the Buck Sulam. Um, there were a couple occasions, a few occasions, where some of those techniques just came out of me. I just, you know, uh, because maybe subconsciously or I was thinking about it all the time, uh, I just, basically performed the technique just spontaneously. Um, and it really did work. I, you know, it wasn't um, something that, you know, I had to think about or anything. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's one of the things that's very much um, valuable to Tai Chi, something about slowly and methodically doing the movements, um, 
and you know, of course, while you're doing that, you're supposedly uh, opening up the uh, flow of chi, the meridians in your body. But like I've heard a lot of Tai Chi practitioners talk about how these movements and techniques just kind of come out of them almost unconsciously uh, in an actual conflict. And when it comes to the Buck Su Lum, I was learning from Sifu Wong anyway, uh, that was the case. It really did just kind of come out of me. I, you know, I use an elbow. I just, it was just stuff that I practiced over and over and over again. And uh, I think that there is a lot of worth to that. I think uh, if you enthusiast, enthusiastically approach these traditional arts, uh, that you know it could definitely work for you in self-defense situations i mean that's what they were meant for anyway um you know these things were developed uh all of these techniques at a time when china was a very much more violent place um you know you would usually be surrounded by more than one opponent uh there's a lot of stories like Fu Jen Song, for instance, he uh, had fought off something like 30 guys with a steel spear. Um, and I, that was kind of a typical sort of conflict that you might find yourself in. Chu Kai himself, too. Uh, I mean, I, some of these are tall tales. I, supposedly, Chu Kai and his student fought off like 100 guys. I don't know if that's, you know, accurate number. But uh, especially not just with hand techniques, but with weapons and how that's integrated into these styles. Uh, that was very valuable information uh, going back, especially pre-gunpowder, but even, you know, in the 200, 300 years ago, uh, when guns weren't even that developed, as, you know, basically hand to hand could come into play just as often as, you know, firearms. So um, I think there's a lot of value in that, um, you know, as far as a legit way uh, in traditional arts can be a very legit way in uh, defending yourself. And, um... How do you see Kung Fu in 100 years? <laughs> That's uh -huh. uh, a question that I always ask. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you know, uh, right now, uh, things are moving so fast in different directions. I, in terms of major historical events, uh, that's a really hard question to answer because I mean, there's just no telling. Uh, I think that um, sport fighting I, will still be around. Uh, mixed martial arts, uh, I think, is kind of here to stay. Uh, and a lot of I, my traditional Kung Fu brothers, they really frowned upon mixed martial arts. I remember when it first really became a thing um because mainly i guess because of the emphasis on arts that they weren't into like i you know brazilian jiu-jitsu which i think does have its merits actually um but uh i i thought that it was actually interesting i i thought that you know, basically different styles coming together and approaches to combat, uh, testing those out against other styles was very much an interesting thing. I'm not really so much into the mixed martial arts culture, I guess you could say, though. Uh, the emphasis on competition and dominance over your opponent and all of this, uh, there's aspects to traditional martial arts that I really appreciate um, that I think are, uh, you know, something that uh, 
you know, like a martial code I, that maybe uh, mixed martial artists would be good to adopt. But yeah, I, I think mixed martial arts is still going to be around. Uh, I think that traditional arts also, uh, but I really hope that um, there's going to be a greater appreciation for traditional arts um, within that time, 100 years. I mean, uh, we could see, you know, wushu even more being seen as, you know, a performance art, which I really think it very much is. I think maybe that there are... Um, uh, maybe some practical aspects to performance wushu, but it's obvious that it's um, more oriented towards, you know, putting on a performance uh, and, you know, that maybe uh, that there will be more um, credence given to the traditional arts that left China after the Cultural Revolution. I mean, a lot of traditional masters, of course, left in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they left mainland China to go to Taiwan and Hong Kong and the States. And I think that there's uh, maybe still a little bit of a schism, maybe not as much, uh, as there once was, I, because mainland, when in the 80s, especially in mainland China, when a lot of the more traditional arts in China were being touted as, you know, oh, this, you know, this is just as legit as all of these other arts and ma the ma that are taught by the masters who left mainland China, um, there was almost this, schiz this notion that um, you're still only going to find real effective practical Chinese martial arts in mainland China, as opposed to in all of these other countries, like in the U.S. and Taiwan and Hong Kong. And it's my hope that there's going to be um, maybe a greater unification between all of these schools, including in mainland China. Um, and that, you know, the traditional arts outside of China will be seen as more legit within mainland China. I mean, we don't know what's going to be happening in terms of uh, the political situation in China. But that's really my hope is that, you know, there's going to be a recognition of the traditional arts that left main, mainland China after the Cultural Revolution, because that is kind of a sticking point in a way. Um, you know, not even wanting to acknowledge that that happened, you know, that traditional masters were persecuted uh, de decades ago uh, there. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, I maybe am kind of rambling, but uh, it's my hope that uh, there's going to be uh, a lot more um, credence given to traditional arts uh, outside and within mainland China, because I've seen some stuff uh, coming out of mainland China, uh, certain schools. I mean, there's Buxu Lum there too. There's Bei Shaolin um, that, you know, seems pretty much, uh, yeah, it's definitely related to our Boxulum. Uh, and, you know, it's not as uh, performance based. So, you know, unification uh, is what I hope to see and what I, I think we may see uh, between uh, traditional uh, schools. Uh, I have one more, one last question is, uh, what advice would you give for people that are starting Kung Fu now, like beginners, 
and what advice uh, you would give to people that are already teachers and like uh, long time practitioners that um, they should what they should do to get, get like the next level like uh, advance their kung fu level um well i of course emphasis emphasis on the basics on the stances trying to really um emphasize uh the uh the basics of whatever style you're learning uh I, there was, back in the day i mean strength training uh played a role in that uh when i started with long lam ling uh we did a lot of strength training i mean we were doing push-ups on our fists and fingertips and um you know but i to really get to a next level, uh, just making sure that you have a good grasp of the basics of your style, uh, the stance work, uh, the actual purpose of whatever you're doing. And uh, honestly, meditation. I, uh, I really think there's a lot of value to um, actual just meditation um that would really be uh probably my main advice i you know learning all of the basic priests you know the basic uh aspects of whatever style you're doing but um having a really clear mind and um focus uh i think really will kind of get you to that next level. Um, and for me, meditation actually has helped a lot. And I'm saying just maybe a 10 minute meditation uh, before class or, you know, uh, throughout the day. And that was something actually that I took from Shotokan karate. Um, you know, and it's funny, I, my Kung Fu brothers, a lot of them, there seems to be this uh, schism I, between, I, you know, maybe you could say Japanese arts as opposed to Chinese arts or whatever. I mean, I think that's all just at the higher levels. Uh, a lot of uh, what you perceive to be the art form almost becomes the same. I mean, when you're talking about individual practitioners, um, at a certain level, uh, there's less of a difference really in the way people fight or handle conflict. Um, and, uh, in Shotokan anyway, that was something we emphasized before the class. And I always, uh, kept throughout the years I trained in martial arts, we would meditate for at least five minutes before starting the class. And then after the class, we would, again, meditate, you know, for five to 10 minutes, um, at usually about five minutes, because as teenagers, we weren't, it was hard to keep the whole class, you know, still. But, uh, but yeah, that would be my advice, actually. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's meditation and focus. Uh, in order to get you to that next level. Right. So I would uh, like to thank you a lot. We, we have like lots of conversation and today we, we had a, a big one. It was really, really good. Uh, I learned it a lot and I'm sure uh, the people that we watch will, will learn a lot too. Thank you yes. so much. Yes, do, thank you. Do you have a YouTube channel? I do. Um, it's Phoenix Mountain uh, Kung Fu Academy. Uh, I guess we can put the link. I, and on that channel, I had created some videos to try and combat this um, narrative that uh, Sifu Wong had taught 
uh, or had fought Bruce Lee over the right to teach non-Chinese people. Uh, and it's not a channel that I've created a lot of content for, um, but the videos on there now, I just noticed have a lot of views. <laughs> so I had been planning on creating more content for that channel. Uh, so I guess I would say, look out for more content on my Phoenix Mountain uh, Kung Fu Academy channel. Uh, there's actually a Bruce Lee uh, exhibit that's going to be opening uh, in San Francisco here. It's going to be put on by the um, Historical uh, Society, uh, Chinese Historical Society. Uh, so I was gonna be making some content related to that. Um, but by no means do I want that channel to just be all about the Bruce Lee Wong Jack Man fight. Um, I mean, the one video I have on there of me doing nunchucks, I tried to recreate Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon nunchuck uh, set. <laughs> and it's all of a sudden I noticed it's got 74,000 views. I was blown away. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, we'll be putting more stuff up there. So uh, you can look out for that there. Right. I will put the, the link in the description. So okay. thank you so much. Okay, thank you. People, <laughs> the, the, don't forget to like the video and subscribe for more content. Great.